Well, good morning. It is Tuesday, February the 6th. It is a beautiful, sunny, almost warm morning out there. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We're going to go straight into the King James Bible, the book of Genesis. And this is chapter 37. So Genesis 37 of the King James Bible. And we're going to start reading stories that you're going to be more familiar with. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah, the sons of Zilpah, his father's wife, and Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And his brethren envied him. But his father observed the saying. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, What seekest thou? Oops, I forgot to prepare the page. And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said to one another, Behold, the dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say some evil beast had devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it. And he delivered him out of their hands. And he said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood. But cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him of their, out of their hands, to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass, when Joseph was come unto his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. And they took him, and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread. And they lifted up their eyes and looked. And behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels, bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. 
and his brethren were content. Then there passed by the Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. And Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes. And he returned to his brethren and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of goats and dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it, and he said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt, unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. Wow. It's an age-old story that probably most of us know from when we were children. So the lessons from it are pretty familiar. But what spoke to me was in one of the early verses. Let's go back into over the page here. Uh, back up here. He told it to his father and his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this thou dream that I dream? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come down to bow ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. So his father kept that. Although the brothers envied him, his father kept it in the back of his mind and, and remembered it. Then the father says to Joseph, And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it will be well with thy brethren. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Look how Joseph is obedient to his father. Okay? He's told them a couple of dreams so far, and it hasn't gone down too well with his family, especially the last one. Even his father was kind of put back by it. But he's still obedient to his father. And obedience to our father is everything, isn't it? One of the commandments, obey thy mother and thy father. Obedience to our father, our Abba father. I, I kind of, that just spoke to me, just as I was going through it, it's like, that was a mental note, it just hit me. That, that Joseph showed obedience and that Jacob, or Israel, favored, it, it's amazing how they play around with the name, they kind of flip backwards and forwards in scripture. But of course, Jacob is Israel. And we've got the 12 brothers, which are the 12 tribes of Israel. So, the next thing that jumped out at me, and let me tell you this, when I do this, my prime concern is to read the Bible, okay? To read the Bible, to vocalize the Bible, and to let the words come out, okay? What I do afterwards is not preaching, it is not researched, it is just what speaks to me at the time, okay? And I vocalize it and share it. This is no way a sermon, this is no way validated by, you know, biblical research or anything else like that. It is just what I get out of the Bible. The same way as you would read the Bible and it says something to you. But let me tell you, when you read out loud, you hear the Bible, you hear God's Word. 
So the next thing was, is that they threw him in the pit and then they sat down and ate bread. It didn't prick their conscience one little bit. They cast their youngest brother in a deep, dark pit all on his own. They sat down and ate bread. Wow, that's pretty callous. That's pretty callous. But notice how the one brother, Reuben, didn't want his blood on his hands. He said, don't, he's our brother. We can't kill him, he's our brother. Another commandment, thou shalt not kill. So Joseph's life was spared. In spite of the fact that they all sat down and ate bread after throwing Joseph down the pit, Reuben's conscience was pricked. And he said, we can't do this. We can't kill him. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. So he got sold 20 pieces of silver and it ended up with them taking the back the coat back to the father. Can you imagine? He rent his clothes. That means he just went and ripped his clothes and he put on sackcloth and he mourned for his son many days. Now that doesn't mean six days, seven days, eight. He, many days means a long period of time. You know, can you imagine the pain in his heart? His son has been, as far as he knows, his son has been devoured by a wild beast. And he says, I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. His father wept. That's sad. That's sad. Can you imagine one of your children? That's sad. So we have a story continues in 38, and we know now that Potiphar has bought Joseph, and he's the captain of the guard. So that's kind of a strange, quirky thing. Out of all the people that could have bought Joseph at the slave market, Potiphar stepped up and bought him. God plays his hand. You just never know what's going on, you know? And all of this, as we know, when we look back upon the whole story, we know that this is God guiding everything. God put it in Reuben's heart not to kill him, because if he killed him, the story's dead, can't do anything, you know? No, he had to end up in Egypt. He had to end up in Egypt. And of course, we know what comes. But it's interesting to just take it chapter by chapter and verse by verse and, and let it sink in and realize about it. Um, I'm getting a couple of inquiries about how to find me here on YouTube. For those of you that do watch this video, can you please pass it on to others? Um, and, and maybe if you could share this on the Mountaintop Ministry page. Um, as long as one person does it. I've tried to get Trish to do it, and uh, she gets a little confused with the copying from YouTube and, and finding Mountaintop Ministry and pasting it into there and saying Genesis you know, 37 and stuff like that. Um, but if someone else could do that so that through the Mountaintop Ministry page, uh, people can find me. So if you go to the Mountaintop Ministry page and you don't see today's chapter on there, um, if you could share, if you know how to share from YouTube, and uh, for those of you who are a little more computer savvy, <laughs> and uh, I'm not going back onto Facebook. I've got a 30-day grace period where I can reinstate my account, and it's like almost every day there's a reason why I shouldn't be on Facebook. There's a hundred reasons why I should, but the reasons that I shouldn't are more valid. Um, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. At, uh, it just has to be this way. It's just something that I'm finding. Social media, you know, as an all enveloping, I think is going to be used against us in a big way. It is being used against us in a big way. 
Social media is accessing our children for one. It's accessing the vulnerable in a big way. And we can't allow that to happen. I can't allow it to happen. My stand is that I'm leaving Facebook. I'm not saying you should. I'm saying that I am, and I have done, and I won't be going back, and I feel free. My phone would get down to about low 30s, high 20s percentage on the battery because of the amount of times I would pick it up and search through to see what everybody's saying, who's posting what, what's for sale on Marketplace, blah, 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 blah. Last night, I put my phone to bed and put it up to charge, and it was about 50-something percent, 60, oh, I don't know. Some, it, was in, it was double what I normally have left because I hadn't been using it. This phone is my tool. I'm not its slave, <laughs> okay? And uh, I just, it, there's a freedom that comes with it. There really is. I'm still in touch. Those of you that go to church, my phone number is in the directory. And uh, most of you that have, have made contact with me, um, a couple that have, have reached out and said, you know, how can I find you? I'm, I'm going to take care of that. But for those of you that are a little bit more computer savvy, if you could, um, Perhaps today, share Genesis chapter 37 on Mountaintop Ministry. Just one of you. As long as one does it, it's okay. We don't need everybody to do it. Um, so if you have the time and you know how to do it, I'd appreciate it. And then uh, people can get used to finding finding me. The uh, page on YouTube is Read the Word with Chris. I have now about 525 videos on there. Probably a good 500 or more are actually scripture. There's our very old Rise and Shines that Shane and PK and I used to do. They're on there. There's weddings on there that I videoed. There was a couple of birthdays on there. And there's some real early videos about when I first got my Grumman canoe that are on there. But everything after that, and uh, it's grouped into sections. So the King James Bible is what I'm under now. And uh, it's it's like a, how do you call it? It's a heading on my page, the King James Bible. Uh, I've got devotionals and other stuff on there as well, different lists. And from time to time, I will share things that I see on YouTube and I'll put it on my, share it on my YouTube page. So there'll be other YouTube programs or sermons that I'll share. And uh, don't be frightened of YouTube. It's, it's So far, it has been very good to us. The algorithms that they operate under uh, protect you from a lot of bad stuff that may be out there. And I'm sure there is. I'm sh just like Facebook, I'm sure there might be. But we don't see any of it. Nothing. We see only the good stuff that we like to watch. And they further enhance that by recommending the same kind of things. We watch stuff about Israel, Jerusalem, the Bible, history, uh, medieval history, history about England, history about Europe. It's amazing how ancient history in Europe and England ties back to biblical history. It's really, uh, you know, you you can. I'm familiar with Hadrian's Wall in England that walks be, that goes across the sea to sea between. Uh, England and Scotland. I've walked on a section of it. Hadrian commanded that to be built. But Hadrian also rebuilt Jerusalem in the second or third century, I believe it is. And he actually put temples and statues over where Christ was buried and crucified. He actually marked the very spots. And so when um, Constantine made Christianity, the official religion of the Mediterranean, of the Roman Empire, his mother Helena came to Jerusalem and everyone said, oh yeah, we know where that is. Oh, Hadrian, he came, he built a temple right over where Christ was buried and he put a statue to Venus or whatever it was right over with the crucifixion site. And Helena told her son, Constantine, and he said, get it out, tear it down. 
he said, take every stone and every grain of dirt and throw it outside of the city so it no longer defiles that holy site. And they excavate it down. Now, bear in mind, Romans know how to build. They know how to excavate. They know how to construct. They know exactly what Hadrian had done. And when they got to the original rock where these sites were, they found the original sites. And that's where they are today. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre was founded on that. And that's marvelous. That's fantastic. This is Hadrian. You know, I mean, like he didn't know what he was doing, marking the sites for prosperity for us. He thought he was being, you know, well, I'm going to put my gods over your god, and this is how we're going to rule. All he did was mark the sites for future generations. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Anyway, I've talked too long. It's gone 20 minutes. Thank you for listening. Thank you for following me. Thank you for helping out to share. And uh, remember, God loves you, and I love you too. Bye for now. Speak to you tomorrow.